The fact that you're listening to Revolution Health Radio tells me that you care about health as a topic, but also as an issue. The current medical model is no match for the challenges it faces today, let alone tomorrow. We'll always need doctors, but what we need now is an army of healthcare professionals skilled in helping people make diet and lifestyle changes that could literally save their lives. What if you could earn a living making an impact like that? You can. It's the job of a health coach, and they play a critical role in the future of medicine. Now, not everyone who's fascinated by functional medicine wants to do it for a living, but the people who end up pursuing a coaching career start where you are, curious, passionate, and driven to make a difference in people's lives and on the future of healthcare. I consider it my mission to give health coaches the skills they need to make a difference. That's why I created the ADAPT Health Coach Training Program an online 12-month certification that will prepare you for a successful career as a health coach. Unconventional solutions require unconventional people, and if you're one of them and get excited about the idea of building a career and a business by helping other people make real and lasting changes, we need you desperately. Becoming a health coach could change your life. It could also change the world. Go to cresser.co slash success to learn more. That's K-R-E-S-S-E-R dot C-O slash success. Hey everybody, Chris Kresser here. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. This week I'm excited to welcome back Dr. Ramsey Osfor as a guest. Dr. Osfor is a board-certified infectious disease and internal medicine doctor. He graduated from New York Medical College then completed an internal medicine residency program at California Pacific Medical Center, followed by a fellowship in infectious diseases at UCSD. He's worked for the World Health Organization, Columbia University in South Africa, and the University of California, San Diego. Prior to attending medical school, Ramsey majored in genetics at UC Davis, and he's currently assistant clinical professor of medicine at UCSF. Ramsey is a colleague at California Center for Functional Medicine, so I've had the pleasure of working with him for the past few years. And he's also been a guest on the show before. We talked about celiac disease and its relationship uh, to a possible connection with Lyme disease. And we have also talked about the coronavirus pandemic. So in this episode, we're going to do a brief update on coronavirus at the start, and then we're going to finish up the discussion that we started about celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. It's a really important topic that there's a lot of misinformation out there about, so I'm really looking forward to covering this and getting a COVID update with Dr. Osfor. So without further ado, I bring you Dr. Ramsey Osfor. It's such a pleasure to have you back on the show. Thanks for joining me again. Thanks, Chris. It's a pleasure to be back. So we're going to talk about uh, part two of this of the celiac and uh, gluten intolerance podcast that we did a while back, but I want to first begin with some coronavirus updates because you and I talked about this. It seems like eons ago, right? <laughs> back when we did that first show right. on coronavirus, and a lot has changed since then. And in some ways, uh, uh, little has changed, depending on how you look at it, I suppose. We're still at home. <laughs> We're still uh, in many places sheltering in place. Um, here in Utah, uh, in Summit County, we're starting to, to cautiously emerge. Um, but I know you've been talking and a, a lot about this and, and researching it carefully. So maybe uh, we could just start by chatting a little bit about some updates. You know, what's changed since we first talked? Or how are you looking at this now? Is it any different than when we had that initial conversation? And what are you seeing as the most likely kind of progression of things with the virus over the next several months? Right. Uh, you know, it's been very interesting and I'm following this quite closely. And actually, I have a consulting business called Capsid Consulting, and we're working to, we've been working in skilled nursing facilities for years, and we've been approached by schools and a couple of businesses to help them plan on reopening and reopening safely. So that's been a fascinating field. And now since we've last spoken, we've shifted towards reopening and how can we reopen businesses safely and keep them open and get the economy working? I think that's from a sort of the public health perspective, that's the biggest question at the moment where, you know, and, we're up in schools too, right? Because that's part of, 
allowing people to go back to work is they're not at home with their kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, that's, that's a fascinating subject. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, are trying to wing this and they're, 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 they're trying to do the best that they can. You know, the, the public school systems are different from the private school systems. And we've been working with a private school in trying to help them reopen in, in particular, because the county schools receive, you know, direct guidance from counties and their superintendents and, and the bigger bureaucracy that's involved and helpful in those situations, but the private schools don't have that same support. Mm -hmm. So, but, but thinking about both my kids go to public school and, you know, hearing what, what they're saying from the public school perspective is, has been interesting. They have plans, you know, A through Z, which is a little bit overkill. Uh, for, that's for a lot of choices. It is. I mean, it's not quite, I'm totally exaggerating, but, you know, and, and, and rightly so, right? They're planning yeah. for all of the contingencies, but yeah. I think what we're advising is cohorting. Uh, that means keeping groups of kids with groups of teachers or groups of workers together. If it's, mm -hmm. you know, shift work in a different facility, I think that, that one to of the make contact uh, tracing easier if someone does become infected. Also, yes, that's mm -hmm. definitely to make contact tracing easier, but also to make it so that you don't have to furlough or lay off or go back to home for your entire school or your entire workforce. Because if people are cohorted or grouped, then you can just send that group who did not have contact or did not have high risk contact with others in the organization. You can just send that group back and it's quite interesting actually to to think about it that way so that your school or your business could stay open because you've not had to sort of temporarily suspend operations and you didn't you didn't lose all your workforce all at once right think, so now, one of the interesting questions about schools reopening is you know earlier on in this um, pandemic the the idea was that kids are hardly affected at all. And, you know, when they are, the symptoms are extremely mild and the, the mortality rate and the morbidity rate is extremely low. And I think both of those things are still true on a relative basis, but there've been some disturbing reports lately of kids, you know, admittedly still a, a very small number uh, from an absolute perspective, developing a, a, a very severe inflammatory syndrome that's still not well understood. And also more reports of kids, uh, um, mostly with pre-existing conditions, but some who haven't being hospitalized. Um, so have you been tracking that? And what are your thoughts on that? I have. And that's one thing that is quite scary. Uh, the, so the syndrome is like, it's called Kawasaki disease-like syndrome of the, of the children who are, are developing these weird rash-like illnesses that you might have read about. Mm -hmm. New York specifically, these were reported in Italy to a small degree, and in China they they were not really known. They were not reported. So it, it's it's interesting that we're finding that here. I think it's likely it also happened in China. But Kawasaki syndrome is an inflammation of blood vessels, and as we're learning about the coronavirus, it's affecting the lungs, obviously, but it's also affecting blood vessels and causing clotting disorders in adults. And so it's not that surprising that in some children, it's causing problems with blood vessels, vascular inflammation. And the, you know, Kawasaki's, I've actually diagnosed it in a, in a few patients in my career because, you know, sometimes we see children, there isn't a pediatric infectious disease specialist. And mm -hmm. I've seen quite a few kids and they have a fever and you don't really know why. And the diagnosis is often made with an ultrasound of the heart and echocardiogram that you can see abnormalities in blood vessels. In traditional uh, Kawasaki's disease, that's a disease that doesn't have a known cause, but in, in the, the disease syndrome that we're seeing in children in intensive care units in New York, for example, is similar to severe Kawasaki's disease. And they're, you know, some children are dying. So it's absolutely scary. Uh, 
And the other thing to remember about schools, and there was an article, I didn't have a chance to do a deep dive in it, that came out, I think, yesterday about the epidemiological you know, risk factors. You know, while children are not actually getting sick overall in large numbers from coronavirus, noting what we've just been talking about, they are thought to play a very significant role in transmission in close contact. Think about a kindergarten class, right? Mm -hmm. They're sitting on a rug, they're in front of each other, you know, and I, I used to say the only thing a child willingly sh shares with you is their snot, right? <laughs> well, any parent knows this intuitively, right? The ki kids are a little, like, especially like preschool and kindergarten age kids are like perfect little disease vectors. And, Absolutely. you know, every parent probably has gone through the experience of having an uptick in the number of colds and flus they get when their kid goes from, you know, being very young and staying at home to starting to go to preschool or kindergarten. So, you know, it shouldn't surprise us that a similar phenomenon might happen here with coronavirus. Yes. I mean, it, I, and it's, it is scary. And so that applies to my thinking in schools and, mm -hmm. you know, how we're going to make recommendations. Ultimately, it's up to the schools to decide what they want to do. But, you know, it's complicated to take all this guidance and, you know, you know about the manifestations of the disease, you know how it's spread. I mean, things like, you know, why do schools need to know about the number of air exchanges per hour in a classroom? <laughs> right. like, that's something that I do for infection control, yeah. you know, in nursing homes and hospitals. But, you know, so we're trying to share this expertise with with some people, and we have a, a white paper that we'll publish on our website a little in a couple of days, and you know, talking about some strategies that you can use, and you know, it's an it's definitely an interesting experience here, an, an interesting world. And now, absolutely, I think while we're talking, the uh, whistleblower is testifying. There's a whistleblower testifying in front of Congress about the government's response and how it might not have been his alleging how it might not have been as robust yes. as it should have been. Yeah. So. Well, regardless, I, I, you know, I wrote an email about this a while back. This is in, in planning and policy. There's a concept known as the a wicked problem, which is a problem that's difficult or impossible to solve because it, it's of incomplete contradictory and changing requirements that are often difficult to recognize. <laughs> and then there's a related concept from social sciences called a social mess, which is very similar. Um, and I, it strikes, it struck me all along with this, that Americans in particular love win-win scenarios <laughs> where you're choosing between two, you know, good options. One may be slightly better than the other. Um, we don't, we don't do so well with lose-lose scenarios. And I think that's a lot of the decisions around that with COVID are, lose-lose decisions you know it's like if you reopen schools you know it's not just a clear win because as you're saying we could see an increase in, the, in, in infections that could really backfire on us um, so we're often find, finding that we're choosing between th maybe the least bad alternative and that's hard that's stressful it's not an easy position to be in absolutely no it's very difficult it's a tough it, it, it is. We're in a very difficult situation. I mean, look at Elon Musk and Tesla's factory and you know, right. the, the, the arguments there. It's, it's all challenging, stressful. Yeah. Well, we'll maybe uh, have you back to do a more dedicated episode on coronavirus in, in a few weeks. Um, but this, I want to move on and talk about the topic we had originally planned to speak about before coronavirus hit. Uh, a few months ago now, which was celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity, sometimes called non-celiac wheat sensitivity. And we had uh, talked last time about diagnosis. Uh, we talked about different ways to go about diagnosis. So if folks are just hearing this uh, podcast for the first time, make sure to go back and, and check that one out. But we were chatting before the show and you wanted to add potentially useful diagnostic method that you've been experimenting with. So why don't we talk about that and then we'll skip forward and, and start talking about non-celiac gluten sensitivity because most of the first show we talked about celiac disease. Right, exactly. And, and uh, so the, one of the 
tests that I've been using and, and playing around with, there's been a little a couple of studies on using levels of these uh, blood inflammatory markers called interleukins, specifically interleukin 2 and 8. And you might have heard about that in COVID because interleukin 6 is also uh, implicated in coronavirus disease. But in celiac, we're really talking about interleukin 2 and 8. And these are blood tests that you can get with LabCorp or Quest, for example. And so there has been uh, some published data on using those levels or, or an increase in those levels over baseline in patients with suspected celiac disease. The problem, if you have somebody who's on a gluten-free diet and feels well on the gluten-free diet, and then you know, then they know they feel poorly on wheat, the conventional way to make a diagnosis of celiac disease is give them, you know, three weeks minimum of a of gluten-containing diet. Some people use six weeks, some people use four weeks, but they might feel miserable during that period. And one way to give a hint if there's celiac disease, and let me just put a disclaimer in here that this is definitely not proven the way that I'm thinking of using it, but I'm just using it as a piece of evidence that can increase the, the likelihood of celiac disease in, in my sort of diagnosis or evaluation of a patient. But I think that a lot of data and, and more studies need to be done on this. But what they did was they gave a, a wheat challenge. And the way I'm doing it is using five grams of vital wheat gluten and you just make a smoothie of that and you do blood tests at time zero. So you do you have them go to the lab, uh, they uh, preferably fasting actually, and then they'll do um, a blood test for interleukin two and eight. And then they'll drink this smoothie that they made containing only water and vital wheat gluten. And then hopefully not eat anything uh, and for four hours and then they'll come back to the lab for another test. And then they can eat or do whatever they want. So that if there's a significant increase in IL-2 and IL-8 levels, that makes it likely, more likely that it was celiac disease. So there's some data on this, but what are the confounders? You know, what if they ate a meal that had a little bit of gluten in it the night before? Uh, so th this is definitely not diagnostic, but it's an interesting test that you can do. And Hopefully somebody out there commercializes uh, this type of approach. It's a little bit hard to commercialize because these are, you know, labs that are available and the product, you know, wheat, or if you use vital wheat gluten is, you know, available in even in Whole Foods or uh, just about any grocery store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I'm all for um, expanding the diagnostic opportunities because it's not always people uh, sometimes have the idea that celiac is just kind of black or white and easy to diagnose. And that's really not the case. Um, so the more uh, options that we have to do it, I think the better. Definitely. Let's skip down to talk about um, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So maybe we could even begin with a kind of 30,000 foot view, because this is something that bafflingly to me, at least, there, there still seems to generate controversy in the mainstream media <laughs> and on social media. There's still a, a pretty good chunk of people out there, including journalists, who mock people for saying that they, ha they have gluten intolerance if they don't have celiac. And the idea is that it's not evidence-based and it's just kind of a made-up condition, which um, you know, both from my research and I think you, from yours is provably false or demonstrably false. Um, so what's your take on that from your reading of the research and, and seeing how often this happens in the media? Yes, it's, it's very frustrating. I agree. And, and you know, people are labeled as uh, sort of, you know, oh, you're from California or, or, or you, right. if, you're, you know, if you're traveling or... Uh, or Boulder. Exactly. <laughs> so it's tough. People have symptoms and it's, you know, often difficult to say, you know, if it's celiac or not, uh, but specifically for non-celiac gluten sensitivity, so they don't have the biopsy, the, I mean, the real definition would be the lack of biopsy proven celiac disease, but not everybody is going to have a biopsy. And by biopsy, I mean a thorough, adequate uh, 
uh, multi-specimen duodenal biopsy, including the duodenal bulb, which is not always routinely done by all um, GI doctors. But if somebody has, has had a complete biopsy, it's normal, but they still have significant symptoms on, with, with gluten, or they don't, uh, alternatively, that, that's a severe definition to actually require a biopsy, but you know, alternatively, they don't have any other manifestation of celiac disease, and they, meaning they also don't have any manifestation outside of the intestinal system, uh, then it's probably more likely to be uh, just an intolerance to something in wheat. And uh, there's different components of the wheat that can cause the intolerance. Surprisingly, it's not generally the gluten itself, although it, it can be. You know, and, so, and, and one of the ways to figure out, for example, if somebody is having non-celiac versus celiac uh, symptoms when they have wheat is to actually give them uh, something called vi vital wheat gluten, which I mentioned earlier. So if you give somebody vital wheat gluten, that does not have a lot of the more difficult to uh, digest carbohydrates uh, or FODMAPs, as, as we call them sometimes, that will cause intolerance. So sometimes uh, when, especially when people have uh, too, many, too much bacteria in their small intestine, we call that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. If they have a lot of FODMAPs, uh, they, they will get gas and bloating. And so to take that out of the equation, if you think that somebody does not have celiac disease, you can try them on some vital wheat gluten through a smoothie like we discussed earlier and see if they react symptomatically to that. If they don't have symptoms from that, then it's probably something else in the wheat that's bothering them. And that could be FODMAPs, but it could also be other proteins in wheat that that are non, not gluten per se, but maybe lectin proteins or glutenin or non-gluten proteins, or maybe byproducts of, uh, I guess byproducts of gluten digestion wouldn't make sense because they would react to that with the vital um, gluten right. proteins. Yeah. Right, right. And, and so, so, there's, so there's all these compounds in, in wheat. Let's just talk about the lectin issue for a second. So lectins are plant defense molecules that, you know, I always give the example of uh, nicotine. Everybody knows that, you know, what nicotine is, and it's found in the tobacco plant. But evolutionarily, why is nicotine in the tobacco plant? Well, it's a pesticide. So, it, you know, if a, if a bee or, or another creature will not chomp too much on a tobacco leaf because they'll get high on nicotine and actually die. And there's mm. actually been pesticides synthesized uh, called nicotabinoids for use in commercial agriculture. So, you know, based off of nicotine, but lectins exist in many forms and they're plant defense molecules. And they're usually found in the husk. They're in higher concentrations in the husk. Um, while gluten is a, you know, has some lectin content, it's, it's re relatively minor uh, compared to what's in the husk of the wheat. So things like brown bread or, or brown rice for that matter would have more lectins than white bread or white rice. So that's why some societies have favored white rice or white bread over mm -hmm. others. And, and fermenting, making sourdough bread, reduces the lectin content further, making it uh, less inflammatory and more digestible. So the, the lectins are one issue. There's also compounds in wheat uh, that aren't spoken too much about. They're called amylase trypsin inhibitors, or ATIs. And in, in gluten-containing grains, especially wheat, have much higher content of ATIs than other grains. And so and there's been studies in mice where you, and where you give, and actually in humans too, where you give them some wheat and you, you measure inflammation afterwards, and these are non-celiac people, and you can find that, well, wheat causes inflammation in a lot of people outside of celiac disease. So that's, an in, that's a component that we don't think about very much. And I'll give you a reference. You can put, post that uh, in, in the notes if you like. But you know, they represent about 4% of the total wheat protein. And they bind to receptors that are called toll-like receptors on myeloid cells. And they activate 
sort of cytokine production. And it's, it's, very, it's a very interesting mechanism of wheat causing inflammation. So when we see patients in functional medicine, for example, one of the you know, goals, they, they come in with a lot of issues. And we talked in the last podcast about Lyme disease and celiac, and is there a connection? But we also know that you know, wheat is particularly inflammatory. So we usually recommend a grain-free diet, but if people, if that's very difficult for people, I, I often recommend at least a wheat-free diet, a gluten-free diet because of the amylase trypsin inhibitors, the lectins, the questions around non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and other factors too. Yeah, then we have some of these more newfangled compounds like microbial transglutaminase. Um, tell us a little bit about that and the role that might play. In so reactions. this is, this is uh, interesting. And uh, microbial transglutaminase is, a, is an additive. So it's, it's like the, in celiac disease, we're looking at uh, tissue transglutaminase uh, as, as one of the enzymes that's in your intestinal cells. That enzyme is attacked by uh, your immune system in response to gluten. So when we look at an, a blood test for celiac disease, we're looking at antibodies to tissue transglutaminase. And th this is a slightly different enzyme. It's produced by bacteria, and it's produced by bacteria in the lab and added to breads, including, unfortunately, gluten-free breads, but, uh, but both gluten and gluten-free breads. And it's not a declared additive, uh, which is the interesting thing where you know, I've been finding out that there's a lot of things in food that you don't really understand, especially in the US, less so in Europe and even less so in, and, and also in, in China. And I'll get into that in a second, but what it does is it helps the things stick together. So uh, you know, it helps the bread become gooier or chewier. It gives it that texture. Gluten-free bread often misses that, is lacking that because gluten is nice and doughy. And so some people add this to gluten-free bread. And another additive uh, is called Nabitor, which is actually produced by Fleischmann. The, you, might have, you might know Fleischmann's yeast. It's the same company. And, and that's a, a microbially produced or, or sort of GMO additive produced from bacteria that because of labeling rules, they can call it, a natural product. They don't have to mm -hmm. put a chemical on the food label, which is which is very interesting and uh, and sadly unfortunate that 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 this is the case. So I, I had a very interesting. I have, I have a friend at, who owns a place uh, called Farmer's Kitchen in the town of Davis in California, and it's a gluten free, 100% gluten free facility. And she told me the story, and she gave me permission to share it. That was quite interesting. So at the time, uh, Walter Robb, who some of you might know, he is was one of the co-CEOs of Whole Foods back before Amazon purchased Whole, Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. And he, he was in her cafe. He had heard about her bread and was interested in having more gluten-free bread. And uh, he talked about how he had started you know, in Healdsburg in Sonoma County um, in, in California. And they had, they had frozen bread products without additives. So he helped uh, Roseanne, you know, sold Roseanne's bread in 45 different Whole Foods stores frozen. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, they freeze it because she didn't add any preservatives to it. And, yeah. you know, they, they changed ownerships and, you know, he was trying to get uh, the GMOs out of Whole Foods. He, I think he's the one that made the pledge to remove all GMOs out of Whole Foods, which they were unfortunately not able to do. And one of the reasons that they wanted to add additives or his successors wanted to put additives in Roseanne's bread was that they wanted shelf st stability. So they added three different things. And one of them was Nabitor, this sort of chemical that they can call cultured rice flour or cultured corn flour. And they, that's the name of it, but it's produced from E. coli, from a very, uh, you know, uh, to me at least, opaque. It wasn't easy to find the the mechanism of production, you know. And and they're they're able to say cultured corn flour or 
which doesn't sound bad, right? Or cultured rice flour, which also doesn't sound bad, but it might be bad. It might cause sensitivity for other people. And that's of concern. So, you know, I, I think that with the microbial transglutaminase and other additives can make, uh, you know, people more sensitive to gluten. And there's even some evidence that the microbial transglutaminase can trigger celiac disease when consumed in large or significant quantities. Hmm. Yeah, so the, I mean, this is just an example of how uh, there's more than meets the eye when you just look at this issue on a surface level. Um, certainly, there's, ton, there's tons of research, even without considering all these other additives uh, or, and compounds that indicate a wide range of symptoms and pathologies that can occur uh, from for certain people when they consume gluten, even those who don't have celiac. But when you add up all of these other factors, it, you know, it makes it clear that it's not just about gluten, it's about many other compounds, both natural and perhaps unnatural um, that are in wheat uh, or wheat containing products at this point. Let, let's talk a little bit more now about how this can manifest in patients. You know, we see a lot of patients who come into the clinic and who don't know that they have non-celiac gluten sensitivity because they've never been tested and they don't, and, and even lots of people who don't know that they have celiac disease, which we talked about in the first show, the you know, high rates of, uh, relatively low rate of diagnosis. So let's talk a little bit about how this can impact patients. Right, I mean, I think, in many ways, as we, we've and you've talked about a lot on on your podcast and in your emails that about uh, disrupted microbiome, you know, a microbiome, a microbiome that isn't optimal. So certainly, if you're eating things that are causing your microbiome to be disrupted with things that might be preservatives, or uh, the does the microbial transglutaminase affect your microbiome? Do, do some of these additives cause problems, but does the wheat itself, you know, other than just causing inflammation, how can that present? Well, again, this is the, the, you know, it can present in a myriad of ways, including fatigue or bloating, gas, sometimes depression, any of the symptoms attributable to, to gut dysfunction. But often, you know, I have a, we see a lot of patients coming in that are have a pretty complicated illness. They've been to multiple doctors and they multiple clinics and they're, they're coming to see us. And so we have to try to piece together what's going on. So one of the, one of our first things, and Chris, you're one of the people that, you know, taught me this too, is, you know, let's, let's get them on a, a, an anti-inflammatory diet that does not include mm -hmm. wheat. So yeah. get that off the table. And I, you know, there's, I used to call this the the Bermuda Triangle of trying to figure out where the symptoms are coming from. So people have this sort of fatigue, immune dysfunction, maybe joint aches, maybe uh, depression. It manifests differently in everybody, but what are the symptoms? And the, the, the Bermuda Triangle is really, I, I usually put gluten at one end, but it's really inflammation from food, but gluten being the big bad boy and wheat being the big bad boy as we discussed. And then you know, could it be one end, uh, another corner of the triangle could be, you know, mold or other toxins contributing and another end of the triangle uh, could be infections or tick-borne disease or Lyme disease as we talked about on the last podcast. But I actually add in, now I've, I've made that triangle a square. I just haven't figured out what to call it. The Bermuda square doesn't sound very good. So <laughs> I'm adding, you know, uh, a, a emotional sort of issues or trauma, yeah. you yeah. know, to that. I think that's that's key because you know whether whether or not that's a primary problem. If you're you know, by the time somebody who's you know not everybody that comes to see us obviously is has uh, you know feels un, unwell. A lot of people feel well. They just want op optimal health. But for those that have seen many doc other people and 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 don't feel well. We, we deal with this and that emotional piece, it can come as a result of not feeling well for another reason, for from celiac disease, from a poor diet. So sometimes just uh, 
taking, you, you find out that they have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, you remove the, you know, you put them on a reset diet and you slowly reintroduce different foods. And then you figure out, well, wow, it's really the wheat, but you don't have a high genetic risk for celiac disease. You don't have any markers for celiac disease and you don't have any other things that we can figure out. And you feel a lot better off the wheat. So maybe it was just non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And it's awesome when that happens because that means that you know they don't need to be, uh, it's not a complicated treatment plan. They need to avoid wheat and gluten, but they don't necessarily need to worry too much about cross-contamination as a celiac patient would. Yeah, it's, it's notable to me. I always discuss this with patients too, because oftentimes when I you know, diagnose them with gluten and intolerance, one of the more common responses is, but I don't have any gut symptoms. And we know now from re both research and clinical experience, as you've just been saying, that in many cases, people who have not, uh, gluten intolerance might not have gut symptoms at all. For some people, the main manifestation is skin rashes, dermatitis, eczema, psoriasis, something like that. For others, it could be depression or cognitive issues. Um, and you know, for still others, it could just be kind of more nonspecific symptoms like fatigue or malaise. So I think that's one of the reasons that it's so often missed because doc most doctors, if they're not up to speed on this stuff, will not go forward and do any gluten intolerance testing if there aren't gut symptoms. You know, the classic presentation of someone having diarrhea after they eat gluten. And then, that of course, there's the other issue of what happens if they do go do testing for non, you know, for gluten intolerance, how accurate is that testing going to be? Right. I, I mean, it's, it's really not, it's not that accurate. It's really, uh, it, it really, you have to just see if their symptoms improve and, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's really challenging. In fact, last week I had a patient who had, I diagnosed her with celiac disease. She had the highest blood level. It was over the detectable range of, the, you know, tissue transglutaminase A, oh, I, wow. it's, you know, that, that you can see it's, mm -hmm. it's the highest. And I mean, I often don't see it that high. So, so this is her second visit with me and we started the program of meditation and she didn't want to get, change her diet. So we didn't change her diet and she feels much better. She's doing meditation. She's quarantined at home, which is why she probably feels better because she was probably doing too many other activities mm -hmm. uh, outside. And so now she doesn't have to do all of those activities. She feels better. Uh, she's feeling a lot better. She has no symptoms when she eats gluten. And, you know, she feels much better uh, when I, you know, th than, she, than she did when I first saw her. But now I have to take her off gluten because it will cause cardiovascular disease. It'll cause increase her risk for cancer and dementia. And, you know, it'll cause all the things that chronic inflammation can cause. So that you want to make sure that whether it's celiac disease or not, that, you know, we're not causing inflammation in our diet that our bodies cannot handle and in, in whatever way that manifests itself. Well, that just goes to show that there's so much more to this than just exposure to the antigen or, or the trigger. Um, and this is true, not only in the case of of a trigger like gluten or wheat, but it's also true in a case of a trigger like an infectious pathogen. And I know you appreciate this as an infectious disease doctor. Um, I often have this conversation with patients where, you know, if we, we find, let's say a parasite or uh, a H. pylori or another you know, pathogenic bacterium on a stool test, the question of, of how sick they're going to be doesn't just come down to finding the, the pathogen or the trigger. Uh, it comes down to the interaction of that trigger with the host. Um, and it, your story about this patient makes that really clear because she didn't change her diet. She wasn't eating less gluten, and yet she became less symptomatic by essentially probably shifting her immune response to the gluten. Right. Right. She was having a, yes, I mean, it's really hard to understand, but going back to what you said is that the manifestation of a problem that 
is, you know, with, with something you're eating isn't necessarily in the gut. It can be anything. And it can just be increased inflammatory markers in your blood without you knowing it. So uh, that's that was seemingly the case with this patient. Uh, but, you know, it's a most people would say you don't need a biopsy in, in this patient because her, yeah, one, we're in quarantine right now, right? So, and they canceled all elective procedures. And two, you know, the tissue transglutamase IgA was super high. So, yeah, they, but this is the kind of patient that in an ideal situation, you want a biopsy because you can't tell, you might even want a biopsy after diagnosis and then again, to just make sure that any abnormalities that you saw resolve because she does not have the symptoms. So uh, that's, you know, you wouldn't do that for non-celiac gluten sensitivity, of course. Let's talk a little bit about people who don't respond even after removing gluten from their diet, um, because that's also, I think, a, a lesser known feature of celiac disease. There's the idea that it's completely curable and in many cases curable in the sense that you can you know reverse the um, the pathology if you remove gluten for, from your diet and for some people that seems to be true but not for everybody so tell us a little bit about that right uh, you know there's a so they call this sort of non-responsive or refractory celiac disease some people just call them slow responders and 10 percent of uh, patients fail to heal. And by healing, we mean on biopsy studies. So to make sure that the abnormalities that you see, which are uh, in celiac disease, you, you see flattening of the villi. And villi are these projections. You can think of them as triangular-like projections in, in, or per, uh, pyramidal-like projections in the intestine that are there just to increase the surface area of the gut so that you can absorb more food per meter, if you will, or per centimeter of intestine. And uh, in celiac disease, those get blunted and you don't have those nice finger-like projections. So you want to make sure that those come back and, and they can do a biopsy to check. And you know some fail to respond. And why is that? So let's talk about the, the diet in celiac disease and, and how you manage it. So I'm a believer in having a life and eating out when you can once in a while and, and being able to travel if you have celiac disease. But I think that it, what I call insidious cross-contamination is more of a problem than people realize. So what I mean by that is if you're living in a household and you're a celiac patient, if you're living in a household where there's gluten, you're likely to get cross-contamination. And you know, my, for example, my, my sister, who's a chef, had, a, had a super careful, had one little area in her kitchen for gluten because her daughter has celiac disease. And eventually, for long story, but anyway, she removed that uh, area of gluten and her daughter started playing soccer and she was very fatigued and wasn't uh, sort of a kind of a couch potato person. And now she's much more, she's the same person, but she's more active. She played on the soccer team. She you know, she went from being a couch potato to being willing and having the energy to play on a soccer team by removing the gluten. And this is in the house where, you know, my sister who does all the cooking, she's a chef. She, she's super careful about gluten cross-contamination. So my belief, and I'm, I might be too strict here, but I, I don't think so. And I've had, and I think there's different sensitivities to gluten in different celiac patients. But for most of the celiac patients that I see, I, I really encourage them to live in a 100% gluten-free household. And so I've told college students to move out of shared spaces. I've written letters to universities saying, you know, to let the, them opt out or get their refund back of the meal plans at the shared cafeteria. There's six universities that have dedicated gluten-free cafeterias, including Boston University uh, as, as one at the top of my head, that, you know, that's where I'm hope my daughter goes to school because she has celiac disease and uh, I don't want her eating in a shared cafeteria you know, where they have gluten. I want a dedicated gluten-free facility so that, you know, you, when you want to go out, 
once in a while, or you want to travel, you've got a really good baseline of health. You're not getting, you know, every day, a little bit of gluten from here, a little bit of gluten from there. You're not getting much or any at all on a daily basis. And so that maybe you can handle some cross-contamination when you go out. You still need to be really careful when you go out, but you can't always eat in a 100% gluten, dedicated gluten-free facility. So, so that's kind of my take. And on these patients who don't respond, they're, they're, they're at risk for bone disease and cardiovascular disease and uh, you know, mal malabsorption of nutrients, B12 deficiency, other things. So you really want to tighten up on the gluten cross-contamination. Yeah, that's uh, something that can be challenging to do, but necessary for some people, as you pointed out. You know, what about for somebody who's got non-celiac gluten sensitivity uh, and not celiac disease? And, you know, presumably this has been identified by an elimination provocation, you know, protocol like we talked about before, removing it from the diet, adding it back in, seeing what happens. Uh, for those patients, you recommend that they just uh, use their symptoms as a guide to determining how strict they need to be on the diet? Well, I, I, not exactly. And, and just to bring something up, there's, there's something called wheat allergy, which is different, right? So we want to, that's an, like you, you know, people might have a peanut allergy. You can have a wheat allergy that the reactions tend not to be as severe as peanut allergies, but if, and we're assuming these people do not have a wheat allergy, but I, I would say that they need to be strict because again, you don't know if the fatigue that you get the next day is from maybe a little bit of stress or, or perhaps you didn't sleep as well, or was it that, you know, gluten-free beer that you drank, or was it uh, that the, the gluten in the house or, 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 you know, affected you? I think that you should avoid anything that, you, that knowingly contains gluten, but you don't need to be as strict. You can have gluten in the house. Uh, if, if you have children, you can, you know, make them sandwiches. If, if you don't, uh, you know, with real bread, you can handle it. Things that I would never want a celiac patient to do. And you can go out to eat. And, you know, if they say, if you want French fries, for example, my kids love French fries, even though not paleo, but we have to let them have French fries once in a while. Uh, you know, I have to make sure it's a dedicated fryer that's never seen gluten. But right. if, yeah, but if it's non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and they're not they're not pouring flour on the French fries, then even if there were onion rings in the same fryer, it's probably okay for the non-celiac gluten sensitivity person to have those French fries, but not for the celiac person. Yeah, that's really helpful. What are you looking forward to in terms of new testing, new treatments, and new ways of understanding celiac and, and non-celiac gluten sensitivity? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to somebody commercializing a easy to use test for celiac disease that doesn't require a three week or four week gluten challenge. And um, so like the one, like the one I talked about, there probably are others. There was one study, a company that was doing a vaccine trial for celiac, and it actually seemed to decrease inflammation when people were vaccinated by this, uh, but it would not, you know, it might be a good idea to have something like that for somebody who has celiac disease so that if they got gluten, quote unquote, gluten, uh, they would have less of an immune response. But the idea behind it was perhaps even to allow people to eat some gluten if they have celiac disease. And, and that did not pan out. So the trial was, was stopped. But to see something perhaps that, that you can use to either prevent genetically susceptible people from developing celiac disease or just prevent the damage because in modern life, it's it's super hard to, you know, to to ask. You know, sometimes I like to travel, and and when we travel, uh, 
it's a pain to go out and eat sometimes because you have to ask all the questions. And, you know, we go to France a lot. And I, I, I speak French, fortunately, so I can ask them all in French. But if we go to Spain or, or Mexico, I, you know, we've got to try to communicate. My Spanish isn't as good. Or, you know, we haven't gone as a family to China or, you know, Hong Kong or other places because I'm nervous, you know, about having to navigate that. And I don't want the health of my daughter to be affected. Uh, you know, she'll, she'll, she'll get ADD symptoms if she gets glutened and mm -hmm. it would be a miserable trip for her and all of us. So, <laughs> so we don't want that. And, yeah. and so having some therapeutics to minimize that reaction would be really helpful. Yeah, that, that would be a game changer for sure. Well, Dr. Osfor, thank you for joining us again. Let us know where people can find more information about your practice and, and the other projects that you're working on. Yeah, so at uh, ccfmed.com for uh, functional medicine to become a patient or the consulting for getting back to work is through my business called Capsid Consulting. That's www.capsid with a C, C A P S I D consulting.com. We're updating the website to include a white paper and things about uh, getting back to work for businesses and schools, probably later today or by the end of the weekend, hopefully. So keep an eye out for that. Great. Well, thank you again, Ramsey. It's been a pleasure to have you back on the show. And maybe, like I said, we could do another COVID update at some point in the near future. I would love to. Thank you very much, Chris. Okay, everybody. Thanks again for listening. Send in your questions to chriscresser.com slash podcast question, and we'll talk to you next time. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.